I'd like to open us with prayer today. So let us pray. Most holy God, you have made us stewards of your creation. Help us, we pray, to demonstrate our care for each other and safeguard the resources of your church, that in so doing we may find favor in your sight and protection from all adversity. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Mary Kate Wold, who, in addition to having leadership positions throughout her career in pharmaceutical, health care, financial services, legal, and government sectors. She is the CEO and a board member of the Church Pension Group, and the church insurance companies are one of the affiliates uh, in the Church Pension Group. So Mary Kate, over to you. Thanks, Clayton, and welcome, everybody. It's terrific to have all of you joining us on a Friday and on the eve of Holy Week. We're really grateful for your attention today. Uh, this is one of a series of webinars that we've been hosting to help people in the church better understand our work and our businesses. And you can access other of those webinars. We did one, a couple of them recently on our annual report and such, and they can be accessed on our, um, on our website and uh, our YouTube channel. So please, if you're interested, uh, take a look and see what's offered there. Uh, today, we're going to do a deep dive into uh, our property and casualty business. And you think property and casualty, I think most people know that that's housed under the church pension fund, but it is a little odd. And uh, so the lore is back uh, in the 30s or so, there were some trustees on our board who started a property and casualty company called the Church Fire Insurance Company to serve the Episcopal Church. And uh, they happened also to be on our board and decided it probably would be a great thing to have this property and casualty company housed under the uh, pension fund, maybe to generate additional income, but it was a, maybe just a vanity play that these trustees just thought it would be great to have this as part of their broader portfolio on the pension fund board. But for whatever reason, over a series of years in the 30s and 40s, the uh, stock of the church fire insurance company was contributed to the church pension fund. And we have continued to serve the church by um, providing property and casualty insurance to the Episcopal church for those many, many uh, decades. And yet the property and casualty company, church insurance companies is a separate subsidiary, has to be self-sufficient, run as a separate business um, under the umbrella of the church pension fund. And you'll hear more about that today. Um, leading this conversation is going to be Frank Armstrong, our chief operating officer. And Frank is in charge of all three of our business units, our, our benefits business, including retirement and health, uh, our publishing business and church insurance. And then also making his debut for a larger audience today is Chris Rourke, our new head of church insurance. And Chris joins us after a long career in uh, the insurance industry, was um, joined us during COVID. So sight unseen took a leap of faith and decided to uh, jump into the fray here at the Church Pension Fund and Church Insurance. And we're so thrilled to have Chris and his team today uh, to share more information about the church insurance companies. So I'm going to hand it over to Frank to have, I hope, a very enlightening conversation and, um, and time to entertain your questions as well. Frank. Well, thanks, Mary Kate. And, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. As Mary Kate said, th through COVID, these past couple of years, we really found these type of Zoom meetings and webinars to be really successful tools for staying connected, stay connected with our CPG colleagues, as well as our colleagues around the church. It's given us the platform to share information and to really listen, respond to questions about our lines of businesses. As Mary Kate said, today the feature is church insurance. And, and we, know, we know property and casualty insurance can be complicated, you know, sort of difficult to get your arms around, especially if you don't live it daily like we do. So we're going to spend the next 30 to 40 minutes just unpacking a few things. Uh, we're going to leave time at the end for responding to questions, but as Jermaine said, please feel free to, to drop them in the Q&A as well, and uh, I'll be uh, hovering that a little bit and see if I can add questions along the way. Uh, if not, we'll try to get them at the end. 
before we before we start going in, uh, Mary Kate introduced Chris Bork. We also have uh, three other colleagues. Steve Follows. He is the senior vice president and general manager of Church Insurance Agency. So Steve and team are out and about in the field answering phones. You'll hear more from Steve about that. Kelly Best. Uh, she's manager of our billing and collections team, so she leads that function as well as uh, getting our agents licensed. And then we have Kevin Smith. Kevin is a director of of our property claims team. So again, Kevin's Kevin's out in the field himself, but he leads the team that handles uh, you know property and claims. So as you would expect, a good amount of our time is spent out with our clients in different types of meetings with vestries, wardens, other church leaders. So before we get into the conversation, I'd just like to share one video that highlights some of the ways that we go about serving our clients. My title is a sexton of the church. My love for the church brought me here. I take care of this building, this beautiful building. What I love most about this work is making an environment for people to come and do their worship. What I enjoy the most about my job is the client. I meet some wonderful people who's, who have the biggest hearts who have volunteered to serve these churches that many times they've grown up in. Our representatives are on the road most of the time, visiting with the clients, walking through the property, looking at things like making a safer place to worship and reviewing the coverages to make sure they're proper. So the one thing that we do that's different, unique, is that we actually go out and see the church. Meeting church insurance was tremendous. These folks were great. They were open, they were honest, they told me what I had, what I needed to do to take care of things, and they listened. Wow. Anything you need, I'm going to come out and meet with you and we're going to walk side by side through your building and find things that we can improve upon. They gave me ideas on building maintenance, they gave me ideas on our pipe organ, a tremendous asset to our, our worship and our parish. We don't expect a senior warden newly appointed to the vestry to know everything there is about insuring churches. Hopefully we do. It's like, wow, these guys know so much more than I would have even imagined. I mean, insurance telling me how to take care of my glass? Whoa! They gave me simple ways to take care of my stained glass windows without a whole redo. Well, because of church insurance, I'm gonna be saving our church money. What really differentiates us from the typical for-profit carrier is the personal touch. They gave me ideas on values of things that I had no, no clue about before, and the value of knowing I've got an ally all of a sudden that I didn't know I had. Let's hear from some of the faces that you've seen on that video there. Chris, we'll start with you. As Mary Kate said, you lead church insurance companies. You've been here a little bit over half a year. Uh, joined in the pandemic, you and I have met many times on Zoom. Maybe next week we're going to actually meet face to face, but we we decided to wear the same jacket, so that's good. Um, I, I I thought it'd be helpful if you could just set the stage for us a little bit in your own words. You know, overview of of church insurance companies, sort of you know who we are, products we make available, and and just what we're all about, how we go about serving the Episcopal Church. Sure. Thanks, Frank. Hello, everybody. Um, really looking forward to this next hour and sharing with you more about church insurance and uh, hopefully giving you a better sense for us. And we look forward to getting the questions as well in the chat. Uh, so we're headquartered in Bennington, Vermont, uh, yet we have agents across the country uh, to serve all of our clients. And as Mary Kate mentioned, we were founded uh, almost 100 years ago, first to provide that fire insurance for those church buildings. But as time went on, we expanded to liability coverages. And those are for, you have parishioners or, or guests on premises and they slip and fall or have an accident. It was insurance to extend there. And, and then through the years, uh, we've We've added the ability to have automobile and workers' compensation coverage, as well as some other specialty coverages, such as crime, uh, employment practices, directors and officers, and even most recently, uh, cyber liability and active shooter coverage. And what we try to do is bundle it all together uh, to make it uh, easy for our clients uh, to, to work through. Um, so a few things that are unique, we are solely focused on 
the Episcopal Church and, and its members. Uh, we're not trying to be all things to all industries. Um, we focus our product set, our risk management efforts, and, and all of our client service initiatives uh, are, are based and focused on the needs of the church. Um, and I, in you know, my career, I've you know, not witnessed something uh, you know, this powerful in terms of, of, of the focus that we have uh, and the, really the partnership. Um, Mary Kate mentioned we are part of the church pension fund. That said, we are independent in terms of we financially have to sustain ourselves uh, over the longer term. And I'll be speaking a bit more to that financial sustainability topic in a little bit. Uh, and finally, you know, we understand that insurance can be one of the top two or three expenses uh, that a church has in a given year, and oftentimes number one. So we're constantly looking at how we can be more effective and efficient as an organization so that we can invest in having the most affordable, most comprehensive uh, coverage and service uh, for our clients. And when changes are necessary, and they are in our business, um, it is to be upfront with those changes, uh, have the conversation, explain them, and make sure we have a shared understanding when, uh, when those times occur. So I will pass it back to Frank. Thanks, Chris. Very helpful. So I'm going to let me switch to Steve. So Steve, saw you on the video there you know, out and about with our clients, you know, identifying risks and opportunities, a true, a true field general, I would say. And I know you've been in the industry for a while. You know, my, my hair's getting whiter. Yours, uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to talk about your Just hair. Just go but, away. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I know you've spent, you know, you've been with us for a long time, but you've also had experience in, uh, you know, with the broader industry, with property and casualty dealing with churches. So you've got you've got a, a good you know scan of the industry, and I know you stay on top of the emerging landscape. So it'd be helpful just in your experiences, sort of you know what what makes us different, what makes church insurance different. Sure, thanks, Frank. I've stopped giving the number of years I was with the organization. I just said, well, I had a full head of hair uh, when I started, and people get the idea that that I've got a little experience. Uh, you know what really makes us different. You know, we've changed over the years. The fire insurance company that Mary Kate uh, talked about, you know, worked wonderfully until uh, we had extension ministries and we were writing social service agencies and apartment buildings and things of that nature. And we opened up a captive insurance program, which is a self-insured vehicle um, in 2000. And there were a number of benefits to that. Uh, first and foremost, premium taxes. Uh, so there were about uh, three points on the dollar that we didn't have to pay in tax that we could pass along in terms of savings uh, of the premiums for administrators, treasurers, church treasurers. We had seven different lines of coverage, all billed quarterly, all at different times. So you had 28 different bills coming to the church. Uh, the captive allowed us to send a single uh, unified bill through Kelly's unit uh, four times a year with all the lines of coverage. Diocese love the captive model, I think, because they know that if you're with church insurance, you have a very broad program, very broad protection. Um, it's not an a la carte where something might be missing when a lawsuit is filed. You know, we have a, uh, a safety program so that we will not only meet with the vestry, but go through the building go through uh, how money is handled, for example. We have a, a, a survey that I'll talk a little bit about uh, outside groups. So if you do use the church as a warming hut, uh, you know, the coverage is there. We cover your operations. What we try to do through the safety program is give you the tips that will make it a safer activity and protect the people and protect the church um, you know, really for outside groups, somebody had asked the question, it's really about control of the building. Uh, certainly find that, you know, we know you're going to have these programs and outside folks using the building. It's really about who turns off the lights, more importantly, uh, blows out the candles, uh, locks the door on their way out. You'll find all of those tips at churchinsurance.org. Uh, we also have a uh, safety and insurance manual for just about anything that the church is, is doing that you can reference. What the safety program does is it will over time reduce claims. And the more claims are reduced, 
the better premiums are, the less we pay out. And that's really happened uh, over the last four years. We've seen the reduction in claims due to that uh, safety program. The other thing that's unusual about church insurance, I think, is our re retention. Uh, you know, the churches uh, participate at will. They have the autonomy to uh, be part of church insurance if they like. And, uh, you know, we, we're seeing uh, about 99% carryover from year to year uh, of the churches. That, that's a stable book. What a stable book of business does is it allows for stable pricing, uh, which for church budgets, that's a big deal. They, they know that uh, on average, it might be a 7%. Uh, one year, it might be 2% another, depending on the results of the diocese or the uh, company as a whole. And that really is shown in our, our uh, class client satisfaction surveys, well above industry average. It's in the 90 percentile, really for uh, the call center, the uh, billing and collections unit, and certainly the claims satisfaction numbers are outstanding. Um, with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Frank. Uh, thanks, Steve. So, so let me just, you, you talked about our focus on, on reducing claims. And of course, that's always going to be, you know, what we're going to be about, but the inevitable is going to happen. And, uh, you know, the wind's going to blow, the rain's going to fall, the pipes are going to burst. And uh, Kevin, so that's where your team comes in. You, you know, yourself, like I said, you're, you're also a, a road warrior to some extent, but you've got your whole team out there. Um, you're the team that we, you know, we focus to focus on and look to when these things happen. So similarly, you know, most of us don't spend our time thinking about property and casualty coverage until something happens. And that's when, you know, that's when we get very, uh, you know, interested in it. So expectation setting is critical. Uh, and your team does a great job of, with that, but I'd like to spend a few minutes just kind of walking down, walking us through this claims process so we can understand, you know, how it works you know, when and how do we get involved? And then how do we remain involved through the process? All right. Thanks, Mike. Well, the first step, obviously, is, is letting us know you had a claim. You know, the, the sooner you do that, the better. The quicker we can get out there, respond, and look at that damage. Um, but to get the claim initiated, there, there's two main ways. One is the 800 number, which is 800-223-5705. And that's, that's available 24-7. Uh, somebody will be available to take that claim, get that information in, and get the claim started. The other is uh, an email address, cpgclaims at cpg.org. Uh, either one of those will get the information we need to initiate the claim. Um, if you make the phone call, a claim coordinator is going to get the basic information needed to open the claim, you know, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. You know, the why and the how, that's, that's part of where the claims investigation comes in. You know, the, Sometimes they won't even know the when. You know, this might be something they, they discovered damage, you know, after uh, you know, somebody did an inspection and they never noticed uh, they were missing shingles after six months. Uh, so that's why it's important to get those claims reported to us as quick as possible. Once we do get the claim, you know, a, a church insurance adjuster, an in-house adjuster will make contact within 24 hours um, with whoever the point of contact was that reported the claim. Usually it's the same day. Um, they'll reach out and get a little more detailed information as to what happened, what the extent of the damages are, what kind of response we might need to provide to the church. It, it might be something as simple as, you know, somebody threw a rock through our stained glass window and we can handle that quickly through email with photos and estimates and quickly get a check out. You know, or it might be more, the damage might be more intense and we need to get an adjuster out to physically inspect it and write an estimate for the damages. Or, you know, we might not know why the damage happened. We might need to get an engineer out to tell us what happened. Um, once we get those uh, experts dispatched, you know, they'll, they'll do a thorough inspection. They'll provide us with a report. Uh, we'll look at those, um, the details of the facts of the loss, uh, you know, compare it against the policy. If it's, if it's not covered, then we, you know, provide you a copy of the, the report with a detailed letter with, uh, a copy of the policy explaining why it's not covered. Um, but we always try to find coverage. And, you know, when there is coverage, we provide you a copy of the estimate and, um, you know, explain when the check will arrive and explain the next steps as to, you know, how the contract will be involved and how we'll continue to be involved until the uh, repair process is complete. Thanks, Kevin. So, you know, and, and uh, really, really proud of your team, your work. You know, again, the scores are in the upper 90s in terms of those those surveys that your team sends out, which is great. But, you know, 
it's not, it's not 100 percent. And we know sometimes things don't go exactly as expected. So just spend a little bit of time. So, you know, if I'm a client and, you know, I've we've been in some interaction and I've just I'm just not feeling it's going as expected or I, you know, maybe I don't agree with it not being covered or it's covered, but it feels to me like it's going to cost a lot more and that sort of stuff. So just just kind of help us, you know, understand how it works when or how we would like it to work when, you know, things just aren't happening and what are the type of things that kind of become challenges and cause issues to arise. Right. So, you know, as Steve mentioned earlier, you know, we, we do have some pretty high customer service scores, like nine, around 94% of positive feedback from, from our surveys. So at the, at the end of our claim, you know, each of the churches gets a survey to give us some feedback on how we did. And, you know, while we're proud of those scores, because they're obviously, they're, they're higher than industry standard, you know, we're always trying to do better and, and look and see what could we have done better. So the things that, that we see, uh, the common issues are, you know, communication, vendor response, and uh, like you said, coverage. Um, communication is obviously the first most important one. Um, you know, many times a rector likes to be in charge of uh, the communication. Other times they'll hand it off to their junior warden. Uh, and then sometimes you'll get a parish administrator that, uh, you know, has a cousin or a relative or somebody that's a contractor and they wanna get them involved in the loop too. And then there's always, you know, there's always the vestry that has to make decisions as a group uh, before, you know, deciding how to go forward. So. You know, it's our job to set expectations, make sure we're talking to the right people, but we also need, you know, the church's help on letting us know who should we be con um, communicating with, you know, who are the decision makers, you know, who all do we need to include on our correspondence, you know, that way there's not a, a, a drop in communication where the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, you know, the more people are aware of what's going on, the easier the process is going to be. Um, some of the other issues we see are vendor response. You know, we have a, a great relationship with our vendors, whether it be field adjusters or mitigation contractors, general contractors. And you know, through our preferred vendor program, you know, a lot of these churches have preferred access to those contractors. Um, and most times, you know, when we dispatch one of those contractors, they're out there you know, after a storm before their neighbor even gets a phone call from their insurance company. That's usually how it goes, but not always. You know, sometimes, you know, with the Texas freeze, you know, we were inundated with claims over 14 states and we had to respond quickly to a lot of different areas. Some churches are remote and, you know, trying to find a contract to get out there is not always as easy as we had hoped. Um, so in those cases, we end up working with the insurance contractor um, as, as long as they're, you know, communication again, as long as they can explain to us what they're doing, we can work on an agreed scope and price. You know, that always helps the process as well. Um, the last one really is coverage, like you mentioned. Even though we offer a great book of business, it's a, it's a lot more robust than a typical commercial policy. Um, you know, not everything that happens to a property um, is always covered by insurance. Um, but like I mentioned before, you know, if there's a gray area, we always try to find a way to provide coverage. But if it's not covered, it, it, it's not covered. And I think we do a great job of explaining why to the point where the, the church should feel um, they've been listened to and they we did a thorough investigation and tried our best to, to find out what happened and uh, explain why it's not covered. Um, the last one really is, is uh, the deductibles. You know, many people on the coast are familiar with the hurricane deductibles. They're typically um, calculated as a percent of the uh, insured building. So for example, a, a million dollar building with a 2% hurricane deductible, that's, that's a $20,000 deductible. So while they see that on their, their insurance declarations page, they may not really fully understand what that means until the storm hits and then the sticker shock sets in. Um, but they should also know that, um, you know, back before 2020, you know, we had hurricane deductibles that ranged from 2% to 15%. Um, many of them in Florida and the Virgin Islands for Hurricane Irma were 7% or 15%. You know, so the church insurance worked you know, with those churches to get um, get those deductibles down to now where the, those range anywhere from two to 5%. So it's much more affordable. Um, but as long as we can communicate that ahead of time um, and set those expectations, you know, through the communication, that, that obviously helps the, the churches prepare for those kind of events. Thanks, Kevin, very helpful. So I'm gonna stay with you because I, I'm seeing, you know, in the Q&A just certain things and you're hitting on some of it, but, uh, and maybe talk a little bit about 2021 and sort of the you know what we dealt with with Ida and that the, the quite 
there's a question that you you touched on a lot of it with the deductibles, but it kind of it kind of weeds into that. Well, you know, sometimes there's surprise on the flood deductibles. So you know, you talk about hurricane, you know, people kind of equate hurricane and flood, you know, as one the same thing and stuff. So I think there's the question is, you know, we get sort of surprised by that. So can we, are the things that we can do to educate better and or reduce some of those deductibles or have that have a conversation up front? So as you're saying, there's not that surprise down the line. So so maybe just expand a little bit, you or Chris or somebody on just, you know, sort of hurricane versus flood and deductibles. Right. I think you know, the biggest thing to understand is church insurance offers private flood insurance. Um, through our package policy. Um, and that does come with a 2% flood deductible. Um, but just because a flood occurred during a hurricane it does not mean that it's a, a hurricane loss. So there, there are distinctions. Um, and to keep in mind too, because church insurance offers the private flood insurance, you know, many of the other commercial policies out there um, do not. You would have to buy that privately through the, uh, the NFIP, the Government Insurance Flood Program. And those come with their own limitations. Um, I think Steve or Chris might be able to speak a little bit more about what those, you know, costs and premiums and deductibles look like, but, you know, we do offer um, excellent coverage when it comes to the flood, the hurricane, um, but we do need to, you know, let them know that um, when these floods occur, they, they do come with a, a higher deductible that they may not be used to seeing. Like I mentioned, the, the churches on the coast where they deal with hurricanes year in and year out, they're, they're used to seeing those percent deductibles. But folks up in the Northeast, you know, when a flood comes along, it might be the first time that they see that type of deductible applied and it is thicker shock. I think that's right. And, and just to add, I think down where you, you do have a lot of activity in the Southeast and during the, the summertime, you know, we have a lot of clients that have a matching uh, deductible um, for both those coverages. So you see the hurricane and, and you also have the flood at uh, 2%, let's say, matching. So, um, so we don't run into that issue there, but it is when you get into as you said, up in the Northeast and it's split and, you know, what was the, the, the peril, if you will, that caused that, uh, that loss. And that's part of what claims does and what Kevin's group um, focuses on. And, and we look for affirmative uh, coverage uh, as we try to find the coverage first. That's, that's what we do. Um, and with that, I just want to also add, you know, Kevin, in terms of, and his team and preparing for these storms, um, there are surprises that that winter freeze in Texas that was a year ago February very widespread and and his team was able to respond uh, to the, the church claims uh, on a widespread basis you know all at the same time and getting out and mitigating these losses early is the key to keeping the cost down key to having our churches be get back to business uh, sooner. And, um, and it's all in the planning. It's all in the preparation and having that network set up well ahead of time. Because once the storm hits, the, the phones uh, are ringing off the hook for these contractors. And we already have first priority. And they're out, uh, they're out uh, already starting their work to, to mitigate the loss. So I just wanted to underscore that. I thought very important to share. Thank, thanks both. I'm going to just stay there it, you know, you're talking about contractors. So some of the questions here are around, you know, do we have to use the church insurance assigned contractors? And even if we do, do we get to choose between, you know, a couple sort of kind of questions about how, how does it work assigning that contractor? Right. So there's a uh, preferred vendor program we use that basically what they do is they provide a list of contractors in a particular area that are already licensed uh, and vetted, bonded. It comes with warranties. Um, so it is a good program, um, but like I said, it, it has its limitations as far as um, location, you know, remote locations are obviously an issue sometimes, and, and no, they're not required to use them. It's strictly voluntary, so if they want to take advantage of that service, it, it's, it's worthwhile. Um, it does have some very successful um, stories to go along with that, um, but they're obviously free to use their own contractor of choice, and we'll work with you know, whoever they you know, decide they want to do the repairs. So Kevin, thanks a lot. That's a great job sort of laying out and providing some insight into that claims process. But Steve, as you know, you know, we, our touch points don't start there. You know, we, we have a lot of interactions. We, they start somewhere and a, and a lot of other things along the way. 
So it just give us a little bit of, you know, these other type of interactions, you know, how many miles do we log, you know, how many visits do we do? But I guess more importantly, you know, what do we tend to hear? You know, what do we encounter in those interactions? And then how does your team sort of channel that information back into the organization? Yeah, I mentioned our uh, service center. Uh, that's open during business hours, Monday through Friday, and it follows the sun. And, you know, you've got a dedicated uh, representative in the call center. If they're out for the day or they're on with somebody else and you need immediate service, you can roll to the next available uh, client service representative. They're there for the basic uh, questions. Uh, you need a binder, proof of insurance, a certificate of insurance uh, for an activity that you're doing. Uh, when it goes beyond the call center, uh, we'll give it to our outside representatives, our regional vice presidents, and it may take a visit uh, to come over and look at the property or just to sit down uh, with the vestry and go through some of the new programs if they're starting a new uh, extension ministry. And they're the ones that do the walkthroughs. And, and when they do a walkthrough, you know, they're looking for, it starts with life safety issues. Right. The first thing they're going to do is make sure that if you're on the other side of the fire, there's a door you can get out of uh, and that it's an unlocked door. It has panic hardware, et cetera. Beyond that, we look at the roof. Uh, usually we look at that from the curb. It, you know, we're not uh, OSHA experts, but we know if it looks like a wave coming in from the ocean that we uh, need to talk to them about their their roof and then and then in turn the diocese. Um, if that's what it takes, we also look for the low hanging fruit. Uh, you know, I get scolded if I go to church uh, for looking at the tag on the fire extinguisher or talking about the lighting in the stairwell, uh, it, you know, when my wife wants me to be there to worship. So we just are used to looking up uh, for things or looking behind doors for uh, panic buttons or what's stored in the boiler room in the Northeast, et cetera. And that's what we do on, on the video that you saw. We also have a group uh, that does renewal reviews about 90 days out. They'll get in touch with the church. The review will find out if you've torn down that garage so you're not paying for it and forgot to call us. Or if you bought the uh, widow's home next door and turned it into an educational unit, we'll make sure that we, we add it to the policy. And then we do an update of the valuation of the property. Uh, we do that every three years. Uh, they're really experts at desk uh, updates. They've done they just finished a three-year project where they did a valuation on almost 15,000 buildings. Uh, and it's based on all of the churches at some point have had a professional appraisal done. The nice thing is the flat diagram doesn't change much, the construction type and things. It's a matter of putting it in the software uh, and updating it. For our larger churches, we've, we've appraised them via a contractor uh, as if we were building it brand new from scratch. Uh, and we'll update those every few years. And those are done uh, also at the VP level. You know, we'll send out a regional person if we can't see the building on Google Earth, or you've just put up a new building, you have some kind of challenge. We'll, we'll send somebody out there uh, on foot if we have to, to take photos, to take measurements with uh, uh, their laser pointer and just make sure we have the valuation. Our, you know, our, our uh, nightmare, Frank, is if uh, something burns to the ground, all the way, and we just don't have enough money. Uh, you know, we, again, it's it's a subjective thing appraising buildings. But we've got the software. Uh, they're an industry leader. We feel very good about. We put in what type of heating and cooling unit, what type of flooring, what type of type of roofing, and it tells us, hey, it's going to be three hundred and fifteen dollars uh, a square foot to replace this building. Somebody in the chat asked about, you know, what others do if they're not with us. You know, a lot of the for-profit carriers, frankly, they're willing to write a lower limit of sexual misconduct liability. They're willing to write a lower limit on the property valuation, let's say. And there's a point where we're saying, look, we, we're not going to knowingly insure the building for half of its value. You know, that's not what we're here to do as the denominational carrier. But if you've got budget restraints and that's all you can afford, we, you know, that's where other people, the other 1%, typically go on an annual basis when they're not with uh, church insurance. And then finally, I think, you know, the other touch points are again, claims. Hopefully we're saying, uh, uh, Jermaine, thanks for calling. 
here's your policy number, here's the expectation. If you don't hear from uh, Kurt within the next 24 hours, call us back and let us know. We'll get somebody else out there. We're setting an expectation. We're not saying, hey, Jermaine, call us back uh, when you get your policy number. <laughs> uh, ho hopefully it's a kinder, gentler. And then that goes with along with billing and collections. Uh, Kelly's unit, a uh, wonderful group of people that understand that uh, there are church budgets dependent on plate and pledge or on a grant where money's coming in at different times, uh, you know, like the next few weeks, hopefully uh, plate and pledge is up as we get into Holy Week and they'll work with the churches on those things. Thanks, Steve. But that gives me a good, good segue into to Kelly. So, you know, the we've been talking about the the importance of property and casualty coverage and we've also the you know the realization that it can be expensive and, you know as steve alluded to every now and then right kelly we get a church that has challenges with the uh, you know financial situations um so just kind of walk us through that you know the the normal collections process but also how do we how do we step in to really help you know those clients in those times where they're struggling with those financial challenges sure um so I'll start with, I think because we are different is why I just love my job. So um, <laughs> your typical insurance company is going to automatically cancel you when your payment is late. Just there's no questions asked, right? Um, we actually allow a few days after the cancellation for the payments to arrive. We know the mail delays right now are significant and that payments cross in the mail. So we give it a few days. And if we have not received the payment um, after the grace period, we actually reach out directly to the client. And that conversation is about how we keep the coverage in force, not about canceling the policy. And uh, in fact, it's funny, we talk about just a couple of calls this week. Um, I had people who called me on the date of their cancellation. And just that panic in their voice is just, you know, pains me. So that conversation kind of started with, we will never cancel your policy without giving, without having a conversation with you, without calling you, without emailing you. And I let them know the policy is still in force. And uh, from there, that usually alleviates kind of the fear part of that conversation. And then we move on to how we make arrangements to get that payment made. And sometimes that means just, you know, waiting a couple of weeks. We're gonna have a fundraiser in, you know, this coming week. And we really wanna, you know, get that collection in there before we make the payment. It's just about having the conversation, setting the expectation for when we're going to receive the payment and letting them know that that coverage is in place, that, um, that they don't need to worry about that. We want them to, you know, focus on, on the other aspects of, of um, their ministry. Thanks, Kelly. Yes, your team your team does wonders there, and uh, thankful for that. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to stay here a little bit, and it, this might go back to Steve. But there's there's a theme that I'm reading in the in the Q and A that's about um, like wh where are the decisions made, and, and I don't mean within church insurance, but let's just say within the church. So questions around so. We're, we want to understand coverage and those trade-offs that you were talking about, but who decides that? Is it the diocese? Is it the vestry? Um, there's a question that I can actually answer is, you know, um, are churches mandatory, you know, is it mandatory for churches to, to go with church insurance? You've mentioned that before, but the answer is no. But I know why that question pops up because, you know, dioceses handle things differently, you know, and the discussion around how dioceses work. And um, I don't know if any of that make it mandatory, but they certainly, I know some say, well, we want you to first at least talk to church insurance and that sort of stuff. So just give us a little bit of how how that works. You know, who makes the calls and how do we work with the church to understand that? Sure. The, uh, there are a couple of dioceses that do have canons that, that they're making the decision or they have insurance committees at the diocesan level that will endorse a particular uh, carrier, but the again, the autonomy is up to the individual church. And, you know, we're working with junior wardens sometimes, sometimes it's a treasurer, it's a small church, it's, it's a, a rector. Sometimes if we find out that a Kevin Smith has a, a background in property insurance, we talk him into 
being in charge of, of the insurance. But most of the time we're in front of uh, vestry members and we're making our, our presentation on what, what we can offer in terms of coverage. In terms of what we offer, we are offering a broad, our value proposition here is that it's a broad coverage. The liability ascends from the parish to the diocese. So where you might find $100,000 of coverage in the marketplace, we will carry at least a million dollars, offer many times offer excess coverage, umbrella coverage up to $10, $10 million. Uh, and so we are a, a broad uh, uh, coverage uh, for them. And, and really, if all things are equal, then the decision is usually obvious, right? You've, you've got full coverage on your property, uh, high liability limits. And if, if our pricing is competitive, um, it should be an obvious decision. But uh, and some things with coverage are, are really determined by our reinsurers. We go out to bid, the market determines what's available. So for instance, the hurricane deductibles, the flood deductibles, a lot of that is, is set by the market. 2% is kind of the mandatory. We, we cannot go below those levels and still be able to offer the coverage. Um, while our risk bearing company cannot, we are a full service agency. We can give you a quote through the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, they usually stay with the higher deductible and the 2% because the cost of the National Flood Insurance Program on average is more expensive than the 10 lines of coverage we're offering you in our base package. It's just a very expensive proposition to go out uh, to the marketplace. And it would be the same thing with a, with a name storm uh, deductible. So uh, we meet with a number of different people at the church and diocesan level, uh, and they're allowed to obviously make the decision on, on what's the best fit for them. Very helpful. So just keep an eye on time here. We got 15 minutes and I want to circle back to Chris. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about just why we exist and, you know, Steve's talked about coverage and that we want to make sure that we have this comprehensive package. We know there's, you know, affordability, you know, questions and challenges. Um, it all comes back to that balance of making sure first and foremost, that we remain financially sound. Otherwise, we, we're not going to be good for anybody. So, so tell us a little bit more what it takes. So what does it take for us to meet those needs, to keep doing what, everybody, what all your team is doing and, and be ready and able to meet those commitments, when those financial commitments, when they come our way, both short and long term? Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, and, and that is, you know, that's the challenge I wake up to every day is coming in and, and attempting to, to do that. Um, and first, you know, the insurance business is a volatile industry in terms of results. And we're you know, very dependent on the, the weather. And um, some years the, the wind blows and, there, and, and there's claims that uh, can, can make it an unprofitable year. And then the next year it's quieter. Um, so it swings pretty um pretty dramatically from year to year. So how do we how do we manage through that to um, to keep that balance? We only want to collect enough money to sustain our business and to invest in the services and products that are going to best meet the needs of the church. And that's investing internally in our people and our infrastructure as well to, to do that efficiently. Um, but beyond that, you know, we need to have some surplus of, of money set aside for those rainy days, if you will, that period of time um, where, you know, losses go way up. Uh, we need to be able to absorb that, pay for that, and at the same time, still continue with investing in the business too. So, um, you know, we're we're fortunate that we don't have a competing priority of uh, quarterly, uh, you know, investors looking for that return on equity, you know, every quarter. Um, so, here are some of the things we we take the long view strategically, uh, and in our planning process, and that's a huge advantage because we you know we see past the bumps and we look longer term. How can we be consistent and dependable over the long term for, for our clients. Uh, and, and, you know, that's one of the keys. Um, so you have to have enough to get through, but you don't want to, um, you don't need to overdo it. So some other things are, 
you know, that we look at, we have a reinsurance program uh, uh, that is essentially, you know, insurance for the insurance company. So when these big storms occur, even we need protection at, at a certain level when you add up all of the, the claims. So it's really key to our success. So we spend a lot of time making sure we fine tune it um, to make sure that it's in the right, right place for us um, so that we're protecting. Um, we've made some changes too uh, to try to reduce some of that volatility I'm, I'm speaking to. But Frank, as you do that, what you're doing is you're, you're adding to the cost of that program and we have to pay for that. So, um, so it, it is a balance. It's all a balance. Um, as you sit in the cockpit of, a, of an airplane, it's looking at all the dials, monitoring them, making those adjustments and really taking a balanced and long-term view to things that I think really you know, is the difference. And it's, a, I want, I want our organization to be as consistent as possible and dependable and have, you know, the, the, the our clients feel assured and focus on, you know, their mission and, and their ministry and, and, and know that we're there for them. Thanks, Chris. I love it. I love the, uh, I love the airplane analogy and, and, and I love that you're our pilot. Uh, and we got some good co-pilots with, with Steve, Kelly and Kevin here. Um, Let's, so let's talk a little bit about switch gears and maybe the future. So we've been around, uh, you know, Church Pedigree has been around a little bit over 100 years and church insurance is creeping up on 100 uh, anniversary in itself. And we talked about striking the balance and all that. So when we look forward, you know, what are the, what are the opportunities that we're looking at as well as those challenges um, I know one of them is climate change, and that's that's in the uh, the Q and A. But um, so so we can talk to that. But uh, you know, both sides. Let's talk about you know what we see as our opportunities, and also the challenges, and what we're doing about those challenges. I'll I'll take the lead on this um, and start with a you know a few things that uh, come to top of mind. You know, we're we're excited about the possibilities of the future, and um, and with that though come what are the challenges? What are the things that might keep us up at night? Um, you know, I'm the, one thing that I constantly think of is I, I want to make sure that we are um, staying in tune with the church and, and needs are changing. They're evolving fast and we need to be right there. Uh, we need to be side by side and anticipating those, those changes and needs along with the, the church and, you know, continue to provide the most competitive um, and comprehensive set of products that you know, that are tailored to meet the needs of the church. Um, you know, one effort we have underway now is um, we have a need to modernize our systems. We're on a, a pretty old system across our organization, whether it be from how we issue policies to how we bill our clients, to how we handle claims, to how we service our, our clients from an agency perspective. And it, it is important for the, those platforms to be to be modern and have the capabilities for us to, to best serve our clients. And, you know, in the future, more self-service options, whether it's just to look up a policy or, or your bill or to pay a bill, um, is to have all those capabilities there. Uh, and, and each church can decide what, you know, what, which they want to pick. But, but we have some limitations today, and this is a multi-year effort. Um, but we're excited about it. We're well underway in terms of our kind of our selection of a, of a vendor to help us out. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's on one side, very, you know, very uh, optimistic about it. Climate change. Um, this is an area that does, you know, keep me up at night. Um, this, we've seen the uptick in recent years of the number of storms, the severity of storms. And I, I did see the comment in the chat, you know, coastal communities, um, you know, the more intense these storms are getting, the more of them that come through. Uh, it's challenging. Um, wildfires out west. Uh, we've seen probably half a dozen years here now where well above the averages in terms of, of the risk. So um, there's lots of things happening. The one in, they, they have a term in the insurance industry. That event happens one in a hundred years. Well, it seems like since I've been a church insurance, we've had a few, two or three of them already happen. So uh, is it really one in a hundred? And that winter freeze that went across the South, Texas and many other states, that was an example um, of what we're facing. So the industry itself um, is challenged by this. So we are an industry that likes to look in the rearview mirror 
and analyze the data and say, okay, based on that information, here's what's going to happen in the future. But with climate change, things are uh, they're changing so rapidly, we can't keep up with it. So it creates creates uncertainty, more of a challenge to to forecast out. Um, so you know, what are we doing? First off, we're committed to you know work side by side with with the church to. Uh, to work with you from a risk management standpoint and making sure your facilities are as well prepared as they can be uh, for these events. Um, Steve mentioned earlier, having adequate values. So yeah, larger losses means a larger portion of the building. We want to make sure that you're not left with having to, you, know, you, you get a check for the claim and, and there's still another check to write. We don't want that, uh, you know, that to occur. Um, we look at deductibles. Um, and again, very, you know, we are competitive at that, that low side. Um, and we want to be able to, you know, keep those options to be able to stay in that, to make it um, as affordable as, you know, as can be. And we've increased too on our, our reinsurance program. We've actually bought up higher and, and spreading that out some because we view the long run, we're going to need more um, protection ourselves, the insurance for the insurance company, so to speak. So, um, we'll stay close to it. And that's, that's a key as well going forward. Thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, it, you know, Kelly, you know, Kevin, Steve, if you have anything to add to that, just think about it, but just going to, I'm going to stay in that theme a little bit. There's some questions that are popping in the chat around, uh, you touched on this a little bit, Chris, but maybe a little bit more sort of question of, you know, with all this going on, do we have enough assets? you know, to pay, you, you mentioned, you know, our surplus position and, you know, the hundred year, you know, how do we feel about that? And then again, it's a, a related question is, um, you know, w w the church is losing some congregations that happens, you know, every year. Um, do we, you know, we may expect that we're seeing more of it happening post COVID. And if so, uh, is this, is the business model sustainable? Is there enough, is there enough left for us to continue to serve? So, it wasn't phrased exactly that way, but I think that's the, the gist of it. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, Steve can, Steve can jump in too on the kind of the client, you know, the client piece, but um, we, we had not seen, you know, any um, greater degree of closures. Um, we were anticipating, you know, getting that, um, but we haven't, you know, we haven't actually seen it. Maybe some of those you know, PPE loans and, and such have, have helped. And I think the church has really been creative in, in finding new ways to, you know, to be more efficient, but also to bring in um, revenue in a different way um, and also move to the online service. Um, from um, switching over to the, the surplus, so we are, you know, there's industry benchmarks that we look at. So there's constant, if you have X amount in, in your written premium in total, you should have this much saved away for those rainy days. And we're conservative by nature and we should be because we have to sustain ourselves and with the changing environment. So we push to aim towards being more in the, those conservative uh, areas. And, and we've needed to build that up some recently because we were a little bit low. Um, and I think those staying close to that, because I think those metrics, if you will, the, you know, how much you need is probably going to increase because of the volatility of, um, you know, the weather and climate change is, you know, is one example that would contribute to that. So we're, we're in a good place today. Um, but we're, you know, constantly looking at that because we want to be here tomorrow and 10 years from now for you. So, um, you know, that's, that's, again, it's on my mind all the time. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Kelly, there's a question about, um, it, it goes to billing and collections, and it's around, you know, how much advance time do we give? So we, we have payment terms and a policy, you know, when do we invoice, you know, how much, what's our standard time that we give? You kind of mentioned how we work if, if somebody's struggling, but how, how much, how much lead time do we give for clients to pay? So typically, uh, you're going to receive your first invoice for a renewal um, 28 days prior to that renewal date. So you should get it just about a month before it renews. And then depending on your bill plan, it'll, it'll come accordingly and on the quarter or wherever you set that up. But if they're renewed a little bit late, just keep in mind, if you don't have your invoice uh, by that renewal date, 
it's going to probably come on the on the renewal date and be due the next month. Um, and if there are any ever ever, ever any questions, uh, you could just reach out to us and we could confirm that for you. So, um, but yeah, typically you have a month before that renewal before the first payments due. Sounds good. Thank you. So it looks like we're about which is about a minute out of time here. So um, I think we'll we'll close it here. Um, thanks thanks for um, all these answers. I think we've kind of put a lot out there. Um, and thank everybody for attending, uh, for listening, and for your questions. We we got to some of them. I know we didn't get to all of them. Um, I was trying to catch uh, as much of the themes as I could. But we're going to find ways. We're going to circle back and find ways to. Uh, you know, answer questions. Some of them are very specific and, you know, Steve, I know you've got them. We'll be reaching out to people um, about their specific situations. Uh, we're also recording this webinar and it's going to be posted so um, others can view it if, if that would be helpful. Uh, I guess I, I would just finish with, hopefully you'll hear that, you know, we continue to be focused. We exist through all of our businesses to serve clergy and lay employees of the Episcopal Church. And we really work to balance that. You know, we, we want to offer comprehensive uh, products and services that, that you find valuable and that are affordable. And we know that that's a challenge. And we continue to look for ways to keep things as affordable as possible. So, again, really appreciate your participation, this discussion, uh, and for taking the time to learn more about us. Uh, keep an eye out. We have some of these. Uh, other webinars scheduled down the road, maybe not scheduled yet, but I know we're going to be doing more of them. So keep an eye out for them. Uh, in the meantime, just wish you all the best and take care.